Welcome to Middays at the Meeting House. This is the third program in our winter midday series titled Made by Hand in Boston, the Crafts of Everyday Life. And now I'm very pleased to introduce today's presenter, Joseph Bagley, who will share what archeological finds tell us about two mid 18th century Boston professional craftspeople in a lecture titled From Pewter to Pottery, the Archeology span of Boston's Colonial Craftspeople. As city archeologist, Joe manages the city of Boston's growing archeological collections, makes the city's archeology span publicly accessible, and works to protect and preserve Boston's archeological span heritage. So, um... In 17th century Boston, the vast majority of goods were manufactured abroad and imported into the city. Two big exclusions were cod and ships, which were abundant due to the natural resources afforded to Boston and its residents. Wealthy 17th century ship captains, several of whose sites were excavated in Boston, are filled with items from Spain, Germany, China, Portugal, Mexico, England, the Netherlands, and Italy. In many ways, the geological diversity of goods consumed in 17th century Boston rivals that of today which is remarkable given that the time and resources that were devoted to manufacturing many of these goods by hand and transporting them by ship was greater than they would have been today. Uh, two major obstacles stood in the way of colonial craftspeople. Basically, they were infrastructure and skilled labor. Um, you cannot have a local pottery industry if you do not have potters or kilns. For some time, Boston simply lacked enough artisans and workshops to support its own demand for consumables. The 18th century saw a radical transformation in the system. With the stability of the colonies and the ever-increasing number of craftspeople immigrating to Boston, bringing their knowledge and building the necessary infrastructure, Boston and the surrounding area began to become self-sufficient on numerous fronts. While the docks and the shoreline remained an important uh, location throughout his the history of Boston, the focus in industry began to spread inward from the coast and expanding out the wealth and economic, uh, the economy of Boston from the shore into what's today downtown Boston. So today's talk will focus on two of these industries, specifically the ceramics and pewter, uh, but more specifically two individuals that were actually making pottery and pewter in Boston in the colonial period. So 18th century ma manufacturing was centered at the home. So craftspeople would typically own large enough parcels to place their, per place their personal home, their workshop, their store, and all the necessary storage for equipment and raw materials within their personal um, home lot. The two sites discussed today are no exception. When a Bostonian wanted to buy a good that was produced in the city, they would often go directly to the store of that person and purchase straight from the producer themselves. During the 19th century, in the Industrial Revolution, manufacturing grew, uh, during the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, manufacturing grew to a much larger scale, requiring purpose-built buildings and automization of power production through the use of mills on rivers, such as Lowell, which would have exploded around the 1830s, 40s. So the study of these two archaeological sites can be directly tied to the Big Dig. To call the Big Dig a notorious construction project is perhaps too polite, but for all of the suffering the Big Dig brought, the archaeology that was done in response to the project was nothing short of ground, uh, groundbreaking, every pun intended. Um, the Massachusetts archaeology is supported almost entirely by two laws that exist. One is a federal law called Section 106, which states that all federally permitted, funded, or licensed projects must take architectural and archaeological impacts into consideration through review and, if necessary, archaeological excavation. The second is a state law, which essentially expands Section 106 to include all state permitted, funded, and licensed projects. With these broad rules, a great deal of development, transportation, construction, and demolition projects are reviewed and excavated throughout the state. As a massive federally and state funded project, and again, massive doesn't quite come close to describing the size of the Big Dig, um, the Big Dig needed archaeological mitigation prior to the beginning of the tunnel excavations. That's my predecessor, Ellen Berklin, at work. Um, long before the tunnel excavations began in 1991, archaeologists out of, the, out of Boston University conducted an exhaustive survey of all the property within the potential route of the new tunnel. Essentially, they compared historic maps and data to identify areas of potential importance, then systematically eliminated areas that appeared to have been previously disturbed through construction or other impacts. Their work, which was done in 1975, identified corridors and zones throughout downtown Boston, Charlestown, and Boston Harbor, that would require archaeological survey if the tunnel would impact these areas. And that's a lot of what I do um, as city archaeologists, is I review incoming construction projects to see where there was things in the past, 
what has happened since those things have occurred that could have destroyed an archaeological site, and then kind of look at it to say, is the thing that was there that was important still there or could still be there, and do we need to worry about that potential impact? And then if I have the jurisdiction, try to get archaeological uh, mitigation to occur um, in order to recover some of that archaeological data before it's lost. So two of these areas were the Patty's Alley and Parker Harris Pottery Sites. Archaeology began throughout the city with machine excavations. This is a photo of a machine excavation in place. Um, they're essentially a backhoe trench that's dug with archaeological supervision. They're not exactly scientific, um, detailed, careful excavations, but when you're facing a, a scale of the entire city, it's important to know where the archaeological intact areas are, and sometimes you can't do it with the fine-grained tools up front. You have to go to a backhoe first just to see what's there. Um, once dug, archaeologists would examine the profiles of the trenches and the artifacts found in the soils to remove the, uh, uh, once the soils are removed, um, to determine what was, what, if what was expected to be found in the 1975 research was, in fact, actually there. Um, this further eliminated additional areas for archaeology as trenches revealed heavily disturbed or destroyed archaeological sites. Even the best maps miss things, and so when we get to the field, oftentimes we realize, oh, well, this site was dug up 30 years ago, and now we need to kind of move on. Uh, while backhoe trenches are far from careful science, they are a necessary evil in urban archaeology where careful, expensive, and time-consuming excavations in a disturbed area would be a massive waste of resources and, more importantly, would give developers reasons to prevent which, what they would find wasteful archaeology excavations on important sites in the future. So we do a lot of this work in anticipation of threats in the future so that we don't go and say, let's spend $100,000 doing archaeology in this area that's been disturbed so that the next time we try to do archaeology, they're going to say, well, you wasted a ton of money over there, why should we support it now? So um, this is one of the ways to avoid that, from ha uh, avoid that happening. Once the most intact areas could be identified through the trenches, the archaeologists could conduct a careful excavation of the most significant areas. So the Paddy's Alley site was located in an area that would, be, uh, that would have been part of the North End prior to the construction of the raised highway that destroyed a significant portion of the neighborhood and permanently detached the rest of the North End from the main part of the city. So this map actually shows an outline of the former North End neighborhood boundaries. And you can see that the continuation from essentially uh, the West End, Beacon Hill, uh, Scully Square, which is now Government Center, and Fano Hall, it really wasn't much of a break between kind of the downtown area and the North End. It would have been a much uh, subtler transition into that neighborhood. So the North End area would have essentially been along this line here. Um, today, we kind of use the, the, the park that, that now stretches between uh, downtown and the North End to define the edges of the North End, but it would have extended further west. Um, and if you go back far enough, basically the North End was an entire uh, northern peninsula of Boston that stuck up into uh, the Charles River, um, most of which had been filled in here and here to kind of create this big, massive um, 19th century brick land that Boston was. Um, on today's map, the site is essentially located on the Greenway between the Bostonian Hotel and the Tunnel Administration Building, um, which would be about here on this map, right on the edge of the North End. This is the Paddy's Alley site. Um, yeah, the Paddy's Alley site. Looking back at the historic photos of the area, it is truly remarkable that archaeological sites survived at all. In the 19th century, this area would have been dominated by densely packed brick structures with minimal dis distance between them. It's only in the areas where the brick foundations did not actually dig up and destroy the archaeological sites that the sites would have actually survived. So when you look at this map, everything that's a building on this map, you can cross out for archaeological concerns, which you can see would eliminate a great deal of the city, and yet we still have amazing preservation here. So in the 1950s, when the raised highway was built, which essentially required that area to be removed, the site again survived through demolition of the brick neighborhood and the construction of the massive on-ramp support structures and general movement of construction vehicles. Um, you can see today, this is uh, Hanover Street and the Bostonian Hotel in Blackstone Block. Um, Right. So uh, finally, in the 1970s, the area was paved and used as a, brick, as a paved parking lot. So it was actually located under the raised highway in the 1970s, and that's where most of the archaeology actually occurred, was under the raised uh, highway. 
So um, I really want to start with these maps, even though I know it's not specific to the archaeology of the site, just to kind of get across how remarkable that it is that we even have these sites to begin with, but more importantly, how amazing it is that Boston still has some of its past preserved despite all of these things. It's one of the biggest reasons why uh, we still look for archaeology in Boston is because we just, these are perfect examples of why it's worth trying to find these things because they're, they're still there if you look hard enough and um, they somehow managed to survive. So at Patty's Alley, archaeologists were hoping to find the earliest occupants of the site, the Patty family, who had lived there in the 1600s. Instead, what they found was a remarkably intact landscape associated with the Carnes family. So from 1892, I'm sorry, from October 1992 to December 1992, 10 archaeologists from John Milner, a private archaeology firm, excavated 1,900 square feet of intact archaeological deposits, recovering tens of thousands of artifacts in the process. Um, and they're all associated with the Carnes family. So John Carnes was born in Boston in 1698. His first wife passed away, and John remarried to a Sarah Barker two years later in 1722. Together, John and Sarah had 14 children, and in 1729, John and his growing family moved to the Paddy's Alley location that had already had on it when he moved there, a stone house, four apartment buildings, and two wells. And this is actually his, um, his site here with some support structures relating to the bridge. Uh, at some point in his early life, John trained as a pewterer, likely as an apprentice under a master pewterer. By the time he purchased the Paddy's Alley property, his pewter business was in full swing. Interestingly, Carnes was not the lone craftsperson in the neighborhood, and this is kind of true for the entire city of Boston. His direct neighbors, the ones on the lot surrounding him, included a shoemaker, a carpenter, a barber, a wig maker, and a tailor. Many, many Bostonians, if they weren't directly associated with the seafaring industry, were craftspeople living and working in Boston as a center of commerce. And you can see here the location of the John Carnes site. Essentially, where the end of the North End neighborhood would have been cut off at this, uh, basically a canal that went between um, one of the necks in Boston. So John's second wife died in 1740 and he remarried a third time to Dorothy Farnham. And while John and Dorothy did not produce any additional children, Dorothy raised John's enormous family herself. Um, John was an incredibly wealthy individual, and, some, as, and as someone who produced goods in high quality and high demand, he was able to use his products to leverage goods and services. He was even able to trade an education for his son, John Carnes, um, at Harvard University um, for a set of pewter dishes. And so at the time, Harvard was a, it was a religious institution where you would have gone to become a minister. And just to kind of step to the side a little bit to talk about John Carnes, his son, um, he wasn't particularly a great minister. He went around to a couple of different towns and got booted from them, and then eventually op uh, opened up his own shop in Boston, like a general store. Um, and in uh, November of 1770, John Carnes actually joined this church, um, which I think is a great little story. Um, eventually, he got robbed by the British and was pretty upset, and so he became a spy for uh, General Washington and reported to Washington on the movement of troops. Um, eventually, he was caught and thrown out of the city by the British. But John, his, his education was paid for through pewter dishes produced by John Carnes. So John died in 1760, one of the wealthiest men in New England. His estate included nearly 700 pounds of pewter molds, which is more than twice the amount of all other contemporary pewter smiths documented at that time combined. So John's goods are exceedingly rare, but are recognized as some of the finest pewter work done in Boston history. And before anybody says, what about Paul Revere? I know we're in a church with a Paul Revere bell. Uh, Paul Revere did not touch pewter. So aside from him, <laughs> um, John Carnes was one of the best uh, pewter smiths alive at the time, uh, though he would have been a contemporary Paul Revere. Uh, so two examples of Carnes pewter survive. One shown here uh, is in an ornate lidded mug with a distinct Carnes Boston mark. See Boston there and Carnes above. This example is owned by the Winterthur Museum in Delaware, and the second is actually in private ownership and was purchased at a thrift store. So you never know what you're going to find at Goodwill. Um, the archaeological evidence and data recovered from John Carnes' pewter workshop is overwhelming. Interestingly, though, not terribly surprising to archaeologists, pewter was almost non-existent at the actual site. Though very inexpensive, it was one of the most easily recyclable materials present in colonial Boston, with a melting point so low that it was actually possible to melt the pewter at home. For this reason, nobody ever disposed of pewter, ever. 
Um, and it's and and that was and, and and any that was found was immediately collected for reuse or resale. Uh, even at the Three Cranes Tavern in Charlestown, which was excavated prior to the big dig, the complete excavations of the massive site that burned suddenly during the Battle of Bunker Hill, no pewter was recovered, and most of it had been, uh, assuming that most of it had either been removed prior to the fire, or that the melted blobs that were left of the pewter once the fire was out uh, were scavenged from the site by those looking to recycle the material. So historical archaeology always benefits from having the historic record to bu buoy it and fill in some of the missing pieces. Uh, for example, we know from the probate record of the document I showed before um, that John Carnes owned and bequeathed a pewter wheel to one of his sons. Uh, pewter wheels are an integral part of pewter workshops. Uh, Dennis Diderot's monumental illustrated encyclopedia from 1751, which is a perfect contemporary date with John Carnes' site, actually depicts a pewter wheel in service. Um, it clearly illustrates the wheel turned by an individual while the main craftsperson worked at the lathe. So this is a large wheel here. A person would turn that, likely a slave in Boston. We had slaves in Boston. And the actual pewter maker would be here at the lathe turning the pewter. You would start with a disc of pewter and it would turn on the lathe and kind of look like a saw blade and sort of like a cross between turning wood on a lathe and blowing glass. You would actually take these large tools that look a lot like a wood um, lathe uh, chisel and you'd put it up against the metal and actually bend the metal as it's turning into the shape. So you would start out with a flat disc and kind of push it towards becoming a bowl or a mug or something like that. Um, and the video would have looped and showed that, but um, we'll have, just have to use our imagination today. Um, but it's a really impressive process because it, um, it doesn't, it, you don't cast the metal, you actually shape it on the lathe. So the pewter wheel would have been a major part of this actual process. Um, this technique was the primary where, way pewter vessels were shaped during the 18th century, but handles and decorative elements must, must have been cast in molds before being added later. So in addition to the wheel and molds used for casting individual components, uh, these are some of the casts that were actually found. These are both brass. This is one of the few actual pewter objects found on the actual archaeological site with about 20,000 artifacts found. This is maybe one of four pieces of pewter. Um, uh, archaeologists recovered numerous artifacts that directly relate to the production of pewter and brass goods. So a gouge possibly used for bending the metal on a pewter wheel or used to trim the soft uh, pewter while the wheel was recovered. So, that's the gouge above, and this is um, somebody actually using a similar tool to actually trim the edges of the pewter while on the lathe. In addition, archaeologists recovered a skimming tool, which would have allowed impurities to be skimmed from the surface of molten pewter. Basically, it's a flat spoon that you would have scooped off whatever floated to the top and, uh, before you poured it into molds. Um, Soldering tips would have been mounted into wooden handles and heated directly in the furnace. So uh, this end here would have actually been place inside of a wooden handle, you would have left the tip in, the, uh, in a fire and essentially to make it hot and then we'd use that to, um, to uh, solder the pieces together. And this is actually from the Diderot Encyclopedia, a person soldering, using the furnaces here, uh, a piece of um, adding the elements to the, the vessels. Finally, a metal file used to um, remove casting sprues and a large metal chisel were found. All these artifacts can be directly associated with the production and modification of pewter goods. The John Carn site represents one of the most intact and significant colonial workshops in America. It's remarkable preservation and the wealth of data now available to researchers of colonial craft in early Boston history is a testament to Boston's significance and its un uncanny ability to preserve its own history, even if accidental, while re re remaining relevant in an important city for nearly 400 years. And that's really a key point here. Um, Boston has continually used the same space over and over and over again for its entire 400 year history. Um, we're always competing archeologically with Virginia for some of the stuff that they find, but in Virginia, the sites move around so much that their oldest sites aren't underneath their newest sites. And in Boston, we have you know, the Old South next to Walgreens, and that's part of the continuing legacy of Boston, but also one of the things that make it remarkable when we find stuff from the 16, 1700s that's still tucked into these kind of nooks and crannies that haven't been destroyed. So Boston was not home to just metal workers. The pottery industry of Boston likely employed more individuals than the metal industry. So um, native, uh, pottery did not begin in 1630 with the arrival of Europeans. In fact, it goes back thousands of years. So these are actually two pieces of native pottery that were found in Boston uh, archaeologically, both of which were found on Boston Common. Uh, the one on the left was found near the Frog Pond in Boston Common, and the one on the right was found kind of sort of near Boylston Tea Station uh, during an archaeological dig that happened there in the 1980s. 
Um, the one on the left is about 1,600 to 2,000 years old based on its thickness and the impressions of fabric on the outside. It's one of the few ways we get imp uh, any indication of what fabric looked like back then because it's stuck on the side of the pottery. Um, and this is actually a piece of decorated uh, pottery from the last period that Native Americans were here without Europeans present, uh, approximately 400 to 1,000 years ago. Um, this would have been from the neck of a vessel, and you can see there's these kind of double V carving on the top of it. Um, these vessels would have kind of had a globular base with a neck around the top, and this is where the decorations would have occurred. Um, so about 2,000, about 3,000 years worth of history represented just in the pottery alone on Boston Common. So it was a long history of pottery making in Boston before uh, the Europeans arrived. But fast forwarding thousands of years, the fires resulting from the Battle of Bunker Hill on June 17, 1775 um, left Charlestown in smoldering ruins while the city rebuilt what was lost of not only its first 150 years of architectural and cultural heritage, but also numerous businesses and industries which never returned. The redware and, or earthenware industry in Charlestown was one of those industries. At the height of Charlestown's pottery making activities, dozens of individual potters were active along the shoreline of Charlestown. Their distinct kilns used to fire the ceramics, which were either rectangular huts um, or tall bottle-shaped chimneys with bulbous bases, would have created a line of smoking chimneys around Charlestown's wharfs, which would have been a visual impact that would have distinguished Charlestown's shoreline from Boston while you were in your boat heading into the city, all of which is now gone. During the war, potters in Charlestown were forced to abandon their kilns and homes and fled abroad. Many of these potters headed towards towns nearby where strong ceramic industry and numerous family members who had moved and intermarried amongst other potters in other towns. Um, when they returned after the war, in some cases years later, the insurance companies had collapsed that were insuring their buildings and properties, um, had collapsed under the swell of claims and left many to have to start over from absolutely nothing. The potters found their entire infrastructure gone. Given this, many chose to return back to their original temporary uh, locations if they had even decided to leave in the first place, where they could produce pottery without having to start from scratch. In many ways, the ceramic industry in Charlestown was many of the uh, reasons that Charlestown uh, flourished. And in my personal opinion, I think that uh, while the shipping industry was major, uh, and the actual shipbuilding industry was a significant portion of Charlestown's economy, it was really the pottery industry that kept it going through any ups and downs in the in, uh, economy, and that there wouldn't have been much of a Charlestown to even burn on June 17th if it weren't for these potters um, basically lining the coast of Charlestown here. Um, and this actually played a role in the revolution. Up here is a, essentially a pit that was dug, um, the clay pits in Charlestown. Many of them were being used for bricks, but some of the clay could be refined and then brought down to the shores here to turn into um, pottery. Um, these pits were actually part of the landing area that the British arrived, and many people were actually hiding around the brick kilns, and there's stories of the, um, the, the battle actually occurring with people hiding behind the structures that were made for these brick, the brick-making area. Um, the area we're going to be talking about is uh, near the southwest corner of Charlestown, um, which is the Parker Harris Pottery Site, right on the shore. So the Charlestown ceramic industry was dominated by families of potters, many of whom would intermarry so that they could have job security between their different locations and, in the case of the Revolutionary War, flee to nearby friends and families. Many businesses were passed from father to son, or in the case of Grace Parker, from husband to wife. I'll return to her shortly, but women played a major role in the ceramic industry in Charlestown. Some were potters themselves, often decorators of the final pots, apprentices, but also some owned entire operations. So Charlestown was ideally situated for the ceramic industry. Its three-sided shoreline faced the Charles River, the Mystic River, and the Boston Harbor. And from this vantage, ships could easily traverse the Mystic, collecting raw clay deposited by the former glacier and exposed by the river cut. So the, the Mystic River, where it came down and cut into Charlestown, actually exposed the clay deposits that were there left over from the glacier. Um, the ships themselves could then transport finished pottery to every port on East Coast on the East Coast. Um, the potters concentrated the production directly on the wharfs and shores of Charlestown. You can imagine that a fragile commodity like pottery would have benefit from the shortest possible distance traveled between the production site and the transportation site, plus the kilns located along the shore, if any out of control firing occurred, which we'll talk about that happening in a minute, um, they could be easily doused with seawater to put out any fires. Six pottery kiln sites were subject to archaeological investigation during the big dig. These digs reveal massive quantities of ceramic data on both the production and consumption of these important pieces of Charlestown history. So kilns are surefire signs that potters are in an archaeological site. Archaeologists working at the Parker Harris site in April and May of 1986 behind the former YMCA in Charlestown were attempting to find the pottery workshop or kiln of the family of potters that lived there from 1714 to 1775. 
What they found instead was a massive pile of wasters, kiln furniture, and broken pottery that could be directly associated with the family. When kilns are stacked and fired, things do not always work out for the potters. So this is actually a photo from Old Turbage Village that shows a bottle kiln. So this would have been, um, that's the name of the shape of the kiln, not that it was used to make bottles. Um, so you would have filled it up as high as you could possibly do with uh, as many pots as you can possibly fit in, start a very large fire, and you have to heat up the interior to about 1,000 degrees plus, um, and then keep it maintained at that temperature long enough to allow the glass, uh, allow the, the, the silica in the clay to form an actual glassy product. Uh, this is a photo of a stacked kiln, although in this case, I don't know why they would have only milk pans and a couple of jugs at the top, but you can see also the potter's production um, here. Again, everything's done by hand, but actually the machines themselves had to be functioned by hand. Many potters would have had a kick wheel at the base of their pottering stand, potting stand, but in this case, we know that there were slaves living at the site that we'll talk about in a second, and they may very well have had these kind of wheels, hand-cranked wheels, uh, working the actual potter's wheel where the potter would actually work. So the artifact shown here is called a waster, and it's from the Parker Harris site. These unfortunate occurrences uh, resulted when kilns were too hot, or hot spots form formed within the kiln. While the pottery in the kiln had to reach a temperature that would partially melt the clay, forming its glassier, harder ceramic, too hot of a temperature would actually melt the pot, causing it to be unusable. Nearly all kilns, near all kilns, will find a pile of wasters which are discarded due to slumping, discoloring, breaking in the kiln, or any number of problems that can go wrong when you stick hundreds of objects in a close room and crank the temperature above 1,000 degrees. So in addition to wasters, fragments of kiln furniture like these trivets were also found. Uh, these were used to separate vessels in the kiln and to allow hot air to circulate and fire the pots thoroughly. So these are the actual examples archaeologically recovered, and this is how they would have been used inside the kiln to kind of separate out the pots. That would allow the water, or the heat to flow around the, the pottery. Also would stop the pots from gluing themselves together in the kiln. So the, um, yeah, the mug shown here was likely made by Grace Parker, who's the first known female potter in America in the 1740s. Grace was a pivotal figure in the Charlestown neighborhood of Boston. She and her husband Isaac founded the pottery operation in 1750 on the southwestern shore of Charlestown. They lived on the property with their family and two black slaves in a large, well-decorated mansion built with the profits of their successful business. On their property was the workshop where the pottery is made, which is about here, or possibly here a warehouse where the finished vessels would have been stored before and after firing, a kiln to fire the vessels in, and a pier and dock to transport the finished pottery. It was a one-stop shop. And finally, the store which to actually sell the pottery. Grace's husband, Isaac, died in 1742, leaving the business to Grace in his will. So Boston law stated that women were unable to hold property, but if they married, uh, were, sorry, start again. Boston law stated that women were able to hold property, but if they married, their property was then automatically transferred to their new husbands. This left many women with the decision. They either had to keep what they had and remain unmarried forever, or they would marry and lose control of their estate. And if any of you watched Downton Abbey in the first season, one of the things that happened was the main, um, the, I can't remember everyone's name, but the, um, the mother in the family was the wealthy person joining the family, and her estate went to the Downton Abbey to actually help fund it, and it was critical that her money went towards the support of the building, um, and she couldn't keep any of it. So Grace chose to keep the company she helped make, but in doing so, she never remarried. Not that she had to, her business was very successful and her distinctive wares are easily found on archeological sites all over Boston. So this milk pan was made by Grace Parker and her in her factory, which was staffed by her son, their two slaves, and together they ran the largest redware company in Charlestown. While we know that the pan was made at Grace's Parker, the vessel was not found at the actual site. Instead, it was found at the tavern site located across the street, which was also part of archeological investigations. At the same time, the Three Cranes Tavern, which was the tavern across the street, was also owned by a woman. Um, her name is Mary. And this is a very, it's, it may be rare for one woman to own her own business in mid 18th century Boston, but it was even rarer for, for, the, uh, for that woman to be neighbors to yet another woman who also owned her own business. And together they actually um, clearly worked together because we know that many of Grace Parker's pottery is turning up at the tavern. They were selling to each other. And we have advertisements where Grace, who was basically the kingpin of Charlestown pottery, was buying up all of her competitors and selling them at auction at the tavern. So we can tell that they knew each other very well. Together, these two women were the heads of two of the most important businesses in Charlestown, making them both prominent and powerful business people in colonial Charlestown. So in my opinion, Grace Parker deserves her own monument. 
Um, she and Isaac had 11 children, three of which died in infancy. Well, when Isaac died, he left her with both her business and their children. And I'm trying to convince the Charlestown community to add a float in the Bunker Hill Parade every year on Parker Harris Pottery. Because so I think it would be great to bring back the 18th century um, businesses that were actually lost in Charlestown to celebrate them along with the other businesses in Charlestown that are celebrated in the parade. Uh, just before Isaac died, he per secured a monopoly for the production of stoneware, which is an entirely different ceramic product than redware, requiring a specially built kiln, entirely different clays, and a much higher temperature within the actual kiln. Grace not only chose to keep the property, but also continued with Isaac's stoneware plans in an effort to grow her business. Um, to do this, she hired J James Duche, who was an experienced uh, stoneware potter in Philadelphia, to help make her industry work. Duche and his family arrived in Boston around 1745. James and Grace found a potential source of stoneware clay in Martha's Vineyard, which was pretty convenient because it's just across the bay. They purchased a large quantity of the clay, had it shipped to Charlestown, and proceeded to make a small batch of stoneware in a small experimental kiln to fire it on, fire it in. Um, the clay was apparently not ideal for stoneware, and the kiln and all of its contents melted and then collapsed on its first firing. For reasons not quite understandable, they attempted the same experiment with the same kiln, the same pottery, and had the same results, not just once, but twice more. Wasting an entire year and seriously impacting the profitability of their redware business that they still had to maintain through the experimental phase. Basically, she had to do two different businesses at once to keep one to, uh, f to support the other. In desperation, Grace used her contacts through James Duche to purchase clay from sources uh, used what he used while he was in Philadelphia. Unfortunately, these sources were in Long Island and New Jersey, which were significantly more expensive to transport and severely cut, it into, uh, cut into profits uh, margins for the industry. Though expensive, James Duchesne's new clay source was successful, and historic records show that in 1745, James and uh, Grace were offering blue and gray stoneware for sale in multiple forms and types. Um, for the record, this stoneware remains a mystery. Um, we've recovered tens of thousands of fragments of Potter, Parker pottery, but we have not yet actually found a piece of this missing Charlestown stoneware. Um, it was only used for about five years, uh, eventually, the, the cost of bringing the clay all the way up from uh, New York and New Jersey became so much that they'd abandoned the, prop, uh, abandoned the stoneware industry, uh, but it's still becoming like the, the holy grail of, of pottery industry in Charlestown is this five-year period when they probably made less than a thousand examples of these vessels, and we're trying to see if maybe somewhere tucked into these 20,000 pieces of ceramic that we have in the archaeology lab right now, maybe one or two of them might be a piece of this Charlestown stoneware. Uh, we'll talk about some of the technology that we're going to try to use to, to determine that. Um, her eventual success with actually producing this pottery was met with tragedy. Soon after her first sale of stoneware, Grace lost her oldest daughter. Grace herself died in 1754, leaving her business to her eldest son, John, who was not particularly healthy. Um, John was the most capable potter in the family, but he soon died in 1765. The Parker pottery sold in 17, that same year to Josiah Harris, uh, who briefly maintained the production there until the Battle of Blinker Hill consumed not only the pottery site, the house, and everything in it. So um, I wanted to kind of share some examples of the Parker pottery. Um, it's very distinctive and highly decorated. And one of the things that kind of blows my mind as, a, as an archeologist, but also someone that likes um, handmade goods is how much effort went into some of the most mundane pottery out there. Um, you've already seen an example of a mug. Mugs were very common. Uh, you saw a milk pan that was incredibly highly decorated. That's one of the most utilitarian vessels you could have in a home because all you did was bring it out to the barn where the cow could have stepped on it and filled it with milk and then had it sit to cool. Um, this is a really heavily decorated, recalling these black and yellow uh, Parker stone, uh, earthenwares. Uh, this is actually a chamber pot. So this is the indoor toilet. So they were decorating everything, including um, indoor plates. They really use this. It's, this is the cheapest possible redware to make. All redware was the cheapest possible ceramic to make. And yet, the people that were at this production site were clearly investing a lot of time and energy and artistic ability into the production of these vessels, even something that you would use the bathroom in. This is another uh, vessel. It's unbelievably beautiful. It's, uh, it's called a porringer, and it's, it's a large bowl, about yay big and about that tall, with a sideways handle. And that's one of the ways you can tell a porringer from um, anything else, uh, with these very, very decorated um, arches. And each one of these dots, we can see in one of them where the, the glaze is pulled away, you can actually see the fingerprint of the potter left in the clay. So we know that these are actually fingerprints all over the pot. And in the center of the vessel on the inside, there's a flower painted inside of it. So they really put a lot of time and effort into something that you would eat your porridge out of. 
So um, along the lines of fingerprints, uh, this is kind of where we're taking these 1740 pots that were dug in 1985 and then moving them into the 21st century. So as we were going through the pottery, we started to realize that there was a lot of fingerprints that were actually left on the outer sides of these uh, vessels. And so um, you can see them in this photo fairly well, and they're kind of all over the place. So we're actually using that and we're taking 3D scans of the pottery using a 3D scanner and to be able to pull out the fingerprints from the pottery and manipulate them because some of them are in 3D on, on curved vessels. Um, and actually we got a small grant to actually um, do this laser scanning. Um, and what we're gonna be trying to do is identify based on the fact that some of the vessels you can actually see where both hands grabbed either side of the vessel, move the pot and set it back down. So we can actually figure out which fingers are being represented. And then we can go to another pot and see if we can find the same fingerprints. And if we can, we wanna match up finger to finger. And then we're gonna do that at the Parker, the Parker site where we actually have the pottery being produced. We're gonna go across the street to the Three Cranes Tavern where the pottery is being used and we're gonna use this perfect type example to be able to say, we have a potter, which we already know is selling to the tavern, and we can identify them through their fingerprints alone, which means you can throw out all of the subjective stuff, the colors, the decorations, um, the size of something. You, if it's a fingerprint of the potter, you know it's the potter. Once we do that in an area that we know we have two sites communicating with each other, we can expand that out because the Parkers were selling their wares to uh, Portsmouth, to um, Charleston, South Carolina. They may even gone down to the Caribbean. So we can actually start going through archeological sites in these other areas of the country and see if we can truly identify the, the spread of a Boston potter all around the Eastern seaboard. Um, and you know, we're not curing cancer, but it's a fun thing to do and an interesting thing that we can do that we can bring a part of history back to life. So while John Carnes and Grace Parker represent the 18th century craftspeople who lived, worked, and played in their own home and industry and landscape, and though the style of production all but vanished during the Industrial Revolution, this home industry model has returned. So websites like Etsy, the handmade marketplace, has revitalized the market of handmade high-quality home industry products. With the rumors of a $300 million initial public offering, it's clear that the domestic production of goods has returned and will continue to be a presence on the marketplace in Boston and beyond for the foreseeable future. And then as a final self-aggrandizing plug, um, I'm in the process of completing a book on the archeology span of Boston, a history of Boston in 50 artifacts, which will include not just these craftspeople that we're talking about today, but several other craftspeople that were found in the big dig. We have uh, glass uh, makers, we have shoemakers, we have basically, if you name it, we have an example of it archeologically. Um, that's my talk, so thanks very much. I was just wondering if there was any connection between Grace Parker and the Parker House. Um, I don't know that, actually. I should look that up. You're talking about the Parker House in Beacon Hill, the one that the mayor is associated, uh, the, the mayoral house? I don't know the answer to no, that. No, the Omni Parker House, the hotel. Oh, that Parker House. I got you. Um, Oh, I'm thinking the Park Man House. Um, I don't know the answer to that question, sorry. Uh, that said, the Parker family were very wealthy, very well connected, and um, they got into politics pretty quickly too, which is a whole other side of their story. Um, so I wouldn't be shocked if they were able to, to kind of continue that into the 19th and 20th century. Um, all those children, the mm -hmm. Parker children and the Carnes children, were they eating their meals off of pewter plates or redware plates? they would have been eating the vast majority of their food off pewter. They would have also had other ceramics, many of them English made. The redwares were really something that you would have seen kind of behind the scenes. So in the kitchen, it, the redware would have been everywhere. But if you went to the actual table, you would have never seen it. It was one of those things that like, it would be like serving in, in, um, in Tupperware dishes. You just didn't do it. Um, it was considered almost impolite. But that said, why the heck were the potters making their vessels so decorated? if they weren't supposed to ever be seen in kind of, you know, public, <laughs> essentially. Um, so I think that there was probably some overlap going on there. The mugs would have been consumed at the tavern. So that's a public place too. So I don't, there's clearly some overlap. The idea is that the redware was behind the scenes and the pewter and anything white would have been up front. Um, the vast majority of things would have been on pewter. If you look at any painting of that time period, like a scene from a tavern, it, mostly pewter on the table. And that said, we have no pewter at the site, even though we have thousands of vessels represented of ceramic and some glass too. Okay. All right. Thank you. When are we expecting this book? The book I owe the, the publisher at University Press New England in June, and it should be coming out in early next year. Yeah, thanks.